Venerable religious and dear parishioners, I would like to speak today about the book of Job. And I know it's not part of the epistle or gospel for today, but every year at this time, either at the end of August or by the beginning of September, we read from the book of Job in the divine office or breviary. And I was able to, well, I noticed that, of course, in praying matins this morning. So since there's not a, a time in the year where we otherwise might reflect upon the epistle or about Job in the epistle or whatever, I would just like to speak about that. But a quick note about the gospel for today as our Lord points out the Samaritan helping one of the Judeans or Jews let us be reminded that charity is not just for fellow Catholics we have to remember at this time there was quite the enmity between Samaritans and Judeans and the Samaritans were actually the heretics of their time. They were not following the law. They had erected their own temple on Mount Gerizim, which was strictly forbidden. But nevertheless, our Lord is pointing out that the heretic, the Samaritan, is the one who does the much-needed act of charity. This man was beaten up. He was dying, or at least half dead. And the Samaritan knows this, and he says, I have to help this man. So a very good reminder to all of us. Yes, St. Paul says we do first good to the, to the household of faith. Yes, yeah, so family, fellow Catholics, we practice charity. Remember, we're going to be judged on this, our works of charity to each other, but we do not exclude those that are not of the faith from works of charity. We should try to do good to all. So anyway, going back to the book of Job, we're quite familiar with this wonderful true story. It's not just a fable or an, a nice story to tell. It is something that truly happened in the Old Testament. We're all quite familiar with the fact that Job lost everything. He lost virtually all of his possessions. His children all died in a tragic accident. And then he was stricken with bodily affliction. And then his wife turned on him or said, yo, you're being punished because you must have done something terrible. And then three of his friends come along and they too pile on, so to speak. You must be a terrible man, Job, for you to have to be punished this way. But here is the main point, and we're, we're familiar with it, but I want to share some details, some more details with you today. This was a test of Job. This was a test, and he passed the test. At times, it looked like he might not because his sufferings were so horrible. I mean, don't we just cringe to think of what Job is going through? We, we say, how could I ever go through something like this where everything goes against me? where all the worst things that can happen, happen to me. How would I do it? But this book was written for that purpose of reminding us that often the sufferings of this life are a test. And just as Job, excuse me, as Job grew in his virtue and his merit, so too we grow in merit and in virtue when God puts us to the test. I wanted to read just from the first chapter, just 
because it fills in some of the details that we might otherwise not be aware of about Job and just makes us appreciate this, this story all the more. There was a man in the land of Hus whose name was Job, and that man was simple and upright and fearing God and avoiding evil. St. Uh, Gregory the Great points out that the land of Hus, H-U-S, was a land of pagans. And one of the very first things he points out is this was not a good man among many other good people. This was a good man among many people evil living people. It's easier to be a good person if you're surrounded by other good people. But when you don't have that benefit, all the more is this person a person of true virtue. Instead of going along with the evil way of living of so many around him, he is living as he should. We tend to follow the crowd, do we not? That's the one of the great weaknesses of human nature. I want to get along. I want to do what everybody else is doing. Well, if everybody else is doing sin, we have to swim against that current. Job most definitely was doing that. And there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. And his possession was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and a family exceeding great. And this man was great among all the peoples of the East. Imagine a man of this kind of wealth, power, prestige. He had it all. And this is the man that's going to be put to the most awful test. Something else in, in chapter 1 here is it talks, it talks about how one day they were going to have a feast. Um, his sons went and made a feast by houses, every one in his day, and sending they called their three sisters to eat and drink with them. They're going to have a celebration. Sounds like they're grown-up children. They're, go, they're going from each to one house to another, enjoying a feast. Now listen to what, it's, and this is verse 5. This is what Job does. And when the days of their feasting were gone about, Job sent to them and sanctified them, and rising up early offered holocausts for every one of them. For he said, lest perhaps my sons have sinned and have blessed God in their hearts, so did Job all days. But that verse is telling us that Job is offering a prayer and sacrifice for his children, every one of them. What a good dad, what a good parent. He recognizes his tremendous duty. It sounds like they're already raised, but he's still continuing to offer prayers and sacrifices for them. You know, I'm, I'm, they may have sinned. I'm going to have this sacrifice offered up for them. I'm praying that they will stay on the right path. What a wonderful father Job is. And again, it seems like so many things are going well in his life. Now, it goes on now to the heavenly throne room. And it doesn't work exactly like this, but it's as though God is taking visitors in his heavenly throne room, and the devil happens to stop by for a visit. So this is obviously a poetical way of putting it. And let's again listen to the words of Holy Scripture. Now on a certain day when the sons of God came to stand before the Lord, Satan also was present among them. And the Lord said to him, Whence comest thou? And he answered and said, I have gone round about the earth and walked through it. And the Lord said to him, he's talking to the devil now, 
Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a simple and upright man in fearing God and avoiding evil? And Satan answering said, Doth Job fear God in vain? Hast thou not made a fence for him and his house and all his substance round about, blessed the works of his hands, and his possessions hath increased on the earth? But stretch forth thy hand a little, and touch all that he hath, and see if he blesses thee not to thy face. So Satan threw a challenge into the face of God, you might say, saying, yes, look how well Job is doing, but look how much you've given him. Test him and see if he's really that virtuous you know, strong, godly man. And as we know, and I'm going to just summarize here now, God allows him to go afflict Job. This is where everything absolutely goes, as we say, to hell in a handbasket. He loses virtually everything. And worst of all, the roof caves in on his children when they're at one of these feasts, and it kills all of them. Does Job pass this test? He does. I can't imagine the excruciating pain he was going through, but he would say things like, the Lord hath given, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then God allows Satan to even afflict him, where he's, you know, on a sitting on a, dung hill he's covered with sores it's like what else could possibly go wrong and job at times he barely can pass this test his sufferings are so great but he does prove himself faithful so the lesson for all of us my dear brethren is in our sufferings When God taketh away, do we continue to bless him? It can indeed just be a test, an opportunity to grow. There are a couple of other reasons why God allows sufferings to happen that were not the reasons why God allowed this to happen to Job, because again, God was telling, it sounds like God is so proud of Job, his son, you know, not, not son by nature, but you know, have thou not seen what a good man Job is? He's talking to the devil this way. The other two reasons why God allows punishment or suffering to happen is yes, a punishment for sin. This is why little Jacinta said at Fatima, among her many wise insights and sayings, war is a punishment for sin. But also God allows suffering because so often that's the only way he can reach them. This is why C.S. Lewis says, pain is God's megaphone to reach a deaf world. And this may have proven true in the lives of many of you, where you were away from God, but then you had a great suffering to go through. And through that, you came back to God. You had wandered away from him, and that suffering brought you back. It was God's megaphone to reach you where otherwise you were deaf to him. So whatever be the... the, the reason, again, a test, a punishment, or a call. Let us remember that God allows these for a good to happen in our lives. He will not allow us to suffer more than we can bear with the help of his grace. Yes, we will have to pray a great deal to bear these crosses, but with his grace, we can most certainly do it. It was either last Sunday or the, or the Sunday before. Well, it was last, last Sunday. St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, By the grace of God, I am what I am. 
So reach out for that grace always in the good times that as Job teaches us, especially in the bad times. And God will bring much good through those things that he allows to happen to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.